Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our webinar tonight, Medical Termination of Pregnancy, an Update and Practical Guide. My name is Jenny Pearson, and I'm an Education Officer for the Primary Health Network. Before we go any further, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we're meeting on tonight and pay respect to Elders past, present and emerging. I'm coming to you from Enawan land um, in the beautiful Northern Tablelands. Um, we do um, have an evaluation tonight that will pop up at the end of the webinar. If you could just take a, little, a minute to fill it out, we'd really appreciate it. Uh, we really need your feedback. Um, to keep bringing the topics that you would like. Um, this webinar will be recorded and also put in our library on our website. We have some fantastic speakers um, for you tonight. We have Susie Parker. Uh, Susie is the um, manager of the search project for family planning. We have uh, Dr. Sarah Callister. Um, Sarah works in um, clinic with Family Planning Australia at Newington. Um, Penrith and an outreach post at Blacktown Women's and Girls Health Centre. She's a very experienced GP, um, having worked in Sydney's inner west, inner west for 15 years. We also have Dr Phoebe Walsh. Uh, Dr Phoebe Walsh also worked for family planning for seven years as a senior clinician and educator, and she now runs a private GP specialist sexual and reproductive health practice in Charlestown called Brightwell Health. And we also have um, Erica Drew, who is our Health Pathways um, Manager from the Central Coast. Uh, I think that's all that you need to hear from me. Uh, please don't hesitate to type any questions into the question box. Uh, Phoebe will be monitoring the questions while um, Sarah's presentation is going on. Um, our first presenter tonight, however, is Susie, who's going to um, fill us all in on the search project. So I'm just going to allow Susie to share her screen. And thanks, every thanks very much, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Um, I am Susie Parker, and I'm the manager of the search project. Um, now, I'm sorry, I'm just uh, getting my slides back up. And they seem to have gone, Jenny. So we can see them, Susie, if you just go from, um, start the slideshow from the beginning. Okay, Delk, right, that's fantastic. I'm sorry about that. So the search project, what is that? Um, it's a project that's been funded by the Ministry of Health. Um, search stands for Sustainable and Equitable Access to Reproductive Choice. And the purpose is to build the capacity of local service providers in rural and regional New South Wales to provide high quality reproductive health services. Um, the reason the project was funded was to address the lack of access to affordable um, reproductive choice in rural and remote uh, New South Wales. And we target areas of high social economic disadvantage and women from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander backgrounds. Um, the aim of the project, from my perspective, is to um, partner with GP practices um, and have you uh, work with us in partnership. We, and we will provide you with a number of uh, uh, training and different options to enable you to be um, an, an import prescriber. The principles behind the project um, are to ensure that um, there's no out-of-pocket costs for people who need reproductive and uh, sexual health services. And we're training you, the GPs, in MTOP and in LARC, that's um, uh, um, long-acting long reversible contraceptives. Um, we want to ensure that women can have those services close to home and ideally in a one-stop shop service. Everything that we do is evidence-based and uh, obviously client-centred. And uh, being part of family planning, uh, all of our training is credentialed. And we have um, a number of doctors um, who work with us. You've got um, Sarah tonight, who's one of our doctors, who does a lot of the training. One of the important things that we can do with search is to provide you, the GP, with ongoing support as well as a, a community of practice, as well as a range of um, of clinical governance, risk management strategies, 
um, assessment forms, and in fact, any of the um, any of the documentation that you need to start providing MTOP uh, services. Um, we have um, a resource hub which is online that you can access. And um, if there aren't um, health pathways being developed, then we can certainly support GPs um, and work to work with the, the PHN uh, to do that. Um, as I said, we, we have professional education, we have supervised clinical placements. Um, if you're doing IUD training, um, if you don't um, already um, provide Implanon, um, we can provide training uh, and workshops for Implanon training as well. Um, we have provide mentorship for you. Um, if you become an MTOP prescriber, if it's not something you've done before, you've got access to a range of medical staff at family planning um, if you've got questions. Um, as I said, we have the institutional support. So we've got all the clinical governance uh, documents, the risk management documents. In, in the beginning of the project, a couple of years ago, we actually provided fly in fly out services for GPs, well, mainly Aboriginal health programs. Um, we're not providing fly in fly out uh, for new providers anymore, um, but we still do provide that for some service providers um, if it's needed. Um, we do have a, a robust data collection and evaluation systems. This is a program funded by New South Wales Health. So they um, are very keen to ensure that we're having the impact that uh, we we're planning to have. Um, one of the other programs that family planning has that you may not know about is the Pregnancy Choices Helpline. Um, and this operates five days a week, um, eight till eight. If you um, have any clients, any patients who um, are pregnant and are really not sure about what they want to do, um, they can call and speak to a clinical member of staff and they will actually go through a whole range of pregnancy choices with them. It's not just about MTOP or surgical termination, but really they'll, they will uh, provide that support um, and there's a social worker available if need be. If you're interested um, in becoming an MTOP provider, and certainly after this evening's um, uh, information, you might realize that in fact, with some support um, and a bit of training from us, um, you might be interested, please feel free to contact me. Um, my details are up on the screen um, and I can talk to you further about how to become a search partner. Um, once you've signed up as a partner, you can access the training for free. It's a four hour online uh, self-paced uh, uh, webinar um, that you um, can do in your own time and um, you can become an MTOP prescriber, as I say, with ongoing support. Um, I will let Sarah take over and talk to you now about um, the rest of the evening and I look forward to speaking to you and hearing from you uh, over the next few weeks. Thank you. Thanks, Susie. Um, and yeah, I'd encourage you guys to get in touch with Susie. She's a wealth of information and lots of resources available there. Okay, so I'm going to talk a bit more now about, um, well, actually, I'd like to start off with an acknowledgement of country. So just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands that we're all on throughout Australia and pay respects to elders past and present and extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. And we just want to acknowledge as well that in this lecture and in published guidelines at times the term woman might be used for people that are pregnant and man for the other person involved in the pregnancy. And this is a generalisation that doesn't apply to everybody that you might see and we just encourage you to keep that in mind and try to remember to be inclusive in your practice. A little bit more about Family Planning Australia. So we have our integrated health service with clinics at Newington, Fairfield, Penrith, Newcastle, Dubbo and other outreach locations. We run lots of health promotion programs in schools and community. And we have our talk line, this is the phone number here, and then also the pregnancy um, choices line that Susie mentioned before that I'll show you again shortly. We run a lot of education programs um, for clinicians. We have a research centre an international program sending people out to 
teach about contraception mainly internationally as well and you may well be familiar with our fact sheets that are available on our website. This is our learning outcomes for today. I won't read through them, but um, that's we're just hoping really to, to increase everyone's level of knowledge and comfort around um, the provision of medical abortion in Australia. Um, and this is what we're going to cover. So unintended pregnancy in Australia, abortion in the law, pregnancy options support, medical termination, um, the assessment, medications, procedure and follow-up. And then we've got a few case studies at the end. So a little snapshot of unintended pregnancy in Australia. Um, it's, it's understandably difficult to collect really good data um, in this area. And this information come, is sort of merged from a Murray Stokes internet-based research survey in 2008 and an MJA um, study in 2018. Uh, actually from 2014 to 15, published in 2018. So about 50% of um, Australian women experience an unintended pregnancy and women aged 20 to 24 have the highest rates of unintended pregnancy. It is important to keep in mind that not all unintended pregnancies are unwanted pregnancy. So up to 50% of people continue the pregnancy and parent it. About 30% had a termination, 18% miscarried and 2% adopted out. Of those unintended pregnancies, 60% were using some form of contraception at the time of conception. Most commonly, this was oral contraceptive pill or condoms. So this was from the Murray Stope survey back in 2008. And I think that that's something that's really important to keep in mind is that um, many people who will be coming in for an abortion were actively trying to prevent pregnancy uh, at the time of conception as well. And important to keep in mind both in terms of um, you know, the support that they might need around this unexpected occurrence, but also when we're talking about follow-up contraception and recommending our really effective methods. Uh, and nearly one in five women reported an abortion in their lifetime. And this, that's likely to be an underestimate because of the uh, difficulties around the data collection. So, when someone finds out that they're pregnant, they have options which are to continue the pregnancy and choose to parent, to continue the pregnancy and choose adoption or fostering or to terminate the pregnancy. And within that, they can choose a surgical or medical termination. Um, family planning has some decision-making tools to assist people. And this booklet's freely available uh, through our website um, and might be helpful for you in the context of talking through things with your patients as well, or something that you can give them that they can look through with if they've got a supportive partner or family or someone at home. Uh, and it goes through a range of um, things to think about that might influence the decision. And for some people, that's really helpful to have something quite concrete. There's a space where they can write down their thoughts. And sometimes it's good for people to keep those things so that they can refer back to them later if they're trying to remember how they came to the decision that they made. Other people don't really need much in the way of decision-making support. Uh, and that's just those phone numbers again, um, both are 8 a.m. to 8, 8, 8 p.m. Um, services. And don't worry about writing anything down because all of these will be available, all, all of these presentations will be put up on the website um, later on. There are Medicare item numbers available for up to three non-directive pregnancy support counselling sessions per patient per pregnancy. And anyone who is currently pregnant or has been pregnant in the preceding 12 months can access those services. And they can address any pregnancy related issues for which um, counselling is appropriate. So that can be to do with pregnancy choice making um, prior to an abortion, or it can also be for, you know, postnatal depression or any concerns around choices that are made following on from pregnancy as well. And um, services can be provided by eligible GPs. So there's some Medicare training that GPs can do to access the item number or GPs can refer to allied health professionals. Um, and there are a list of item numbers for that as well, which are all available on the Medicare website. Uh, and just to make a note, so, Restrictive, when often people are concerned about the changes in 
the law around abortion and that it will increase the number of abortions that occur. And this is from the Guttmacher Institute, which has got some really good information if you're interested in looking into things further. But it just shows that restrictive laws don't stop women from having abortions. They make the procedure clandestine and often unsafe. Uh, and so you can see that countries where abortion is prohibited ha actually have a higher rate of abortion than where it's available on request. And what we hope when we offer safe and accessible abortions is that we increase women's access to and confidence in healthcare, and that that might then lead to increased access to and use of our top tier contraception, um, the LARCs. So in Australia, um, the laws around abortion are regulated by the states and territories rather than the federal government. So there are some slightly different laws in different areas, but all states do require that practitioners who have a conscientious objection to providing abortion must refer the patient on to an appropriate provider. And there's been some discussion recently um, about how this needs to be done in that it's not necessarily just enough to tell the patient um, of another service that's available, but they need to have some way of ensuring that the, that the patient will actually be able to access that care in a timely fashion. And also just to note that there's no requirement that a woman's sexual partner be notified of a proposed abortion. It's the woman's choice. In New South Wales, the Abortion Law Reform Act of 2019 removed abortion from the Crimes Act of 1900. So the significance of this is that it puts abortion in the domain of healthcare, um, which makes it a lot easier for everyone to see it as part of whole person care. It's now legal to seek abortion up to 22 weeks of pregnancy in New South Wales. Um, abortion can be performed after 22 weeks, but it's more restricted. Uh, it requires a second medical practitioner involvement and counselling and needs to be done in a hospital facility. In reality, we know that access to abortion remains difficult in many areas, particularly after 12 weeks, and cost can be an issue even below 12 weeks with very limited public hospital or public clinic provision, although this is slowly improving and we're hoping that these kinds of educational activities will increase access even more. If you're interested in more information about abortion and the law, there are resources on our website uh, there's a fact sheet and also Children by Choice is also an excellent website with lots of information on the legal aspects of abortion in all the states and territories if you needed to look uh, anything up in different states because of course it can be done by telehealth in which, which could be done interstate. So choosing an abortion, when, an, when this is chosen the option of medical or surgical is discussed and this includes the pros and cons specific to the patient and different clinical considerations. And our hope is to create a shared decision-making um, process with our, with our clients. It's just a little comparison um, between medical and surgical terminations. Um, and this is in this little booklet, there'll be a, um, I think I've got a screenshot of it coming up next. So medical termination in Australia has to be done at um, less than nine weeks gestation. Uh, a surgical can be done at any time, but practically it's usually done after six weeks. Uh, the cost of both of these things does vary. Um, I've got some figures down here, depending on where you go. So a medical termination through family planning, if you're a, a pension card holder can be bulk billed and there are some GP clinics around that will bulk bill it. But other um, private providers can charge up to $500 for a medical termination. And the out-of-pocket cost for a surgical termination can be around $1,300. Um, it attracts a Medicare rebate of up to $490, depending on what exactly is being done. Um, the key thing with the medical, it's done in your own home, whereas a surgical termination obviously is done in, a, in either a day surgery clinic or some other type of um, hospital type clinic. The medical termination, you do really require an, a responsible adult support person. Uh, with the medical, people will tend to have bleeding and cramping similar to a miscarriage, and the bleeding may persist for up to 30 days, although it usually is resolved by two weeks. And we do require a follow-up 
um, to check that the abortion is complete. So both with a with a blood test and usually with a with a visit um, usually to a doctor, uh, although that requirement has just changed recently. The surgical termination requires a light anaesthetic and it requires someone to transport the person home. The bleeding is usually lighter and lasts less than two weeks and there's no follow-up required unless the person has issues afterwards. And often an IUD can be put in at the time of surgical abortion as well, which is something really handy um, to keep in mind. And this is the little page, again, from that Pregnancy Choices booklet, uh, just going through some of those comparisons. Medical um, termination brings up some opportunities and challenges. So there, there is the opportunity for this to be done via telehealth, which increases um, the access for rural and remote um, clients. They do need to have access to emergency health services. So we would say that they need to be within two hours drive of a, an emergency department um, for the 24 hours, at least following the, the second step of the, of the medical termination. They also need to have a pharmacy service that can dispense the medications or have a way to get this um, posted to them. And there are, um, which you may well be aware of, specific item numbers available for reproductive and sexual health telehealth consultations via the telephone. Um, so there's a, there's a reproductive and sexual health telehealth telephone item number for a, a consultation greater than 40 minutes, which doesn't have the requirement to have seen the client in the past 12 months. So that is quite useful in this particular setting as well. Um, our culturally and linguistically diverse populations. So we do need to be able to access interpreters in a timely fashion. Um, and these will require longer appointments as well. You may need to look at planning multiple appointments to be able to go through all of this information, depending on the setup that you have. Sometimes nurses and doctors can work as a team in doing the assessments and then the provisions. Uh, and then considering social work access, because you will find that um, that there, you know, a number of um, the patients that will be seeking medical terminations are vulnerable as well, um, and may need some additional support. Uh, and this is something that family planning has available to us. I recognise it's more difficult in the um, private sector um, for GPs. So again, hopefully there might be some. Um, top tips when we hear about the health pathways a bit later on. Previously, doctors were, were required to do training via MS Health to become registered providers of medical abortion. And just so that you know, MS Health is a subsidiary of Murray Stokes International. Um, and they were... Um, Uh, they originally were the, the group that were, you know, really enabled us to be to import this medication and to use this medication in Australia. They've been really integral in allowing us to set up this process, uh, and they uh, remain the importer and distributor of MS2 step into Australia. So the requirement to do that additional training was removed on the 1st of August this year, in line with goals to increase access to abortion care. Pharmacists um, previously had to be registered to, to stock and dispense MS2 step, and they don't have to be anymore. Any, any pharmacist can now um, stock and dispense MS2 step, but you will find that not all of them do. And if this is something that you intend to add to your practice, it might be good to ring your local pharmacist and just ask if it's something that they can try and keep in stock. And yeah, before prescribing, it's good to make sure that the client has timely access to the medication as well. <laughs> so the way that we would usually do things at, here at Family Planning and when I've done this in general practice as well is we'd have an assessment visit initially and um, so you'd look at whether support counselling would be beneficial and provide a referral as appropriate, assess the client's capacity to consent and um, sometimes you may be working with younger people uh, and that might um, be a more complex process. Uh, 
you need to get the medical history, including medications and allergies, and establish the capacity to manage the medical abortion procedure at home. So having that responsible adult present and being within two hours of emergency medical care. Establishing the eligibility for a medical termination. So it does need to be an intrauterine pregnancy. So we would advise a dating ultrasound confirming an intrauterine pregnancy up to 63 days gestation. And this is confirmed either through seeing a yolk sac, a fetal pole or a heartbeat. Um, the gestational sac alone isn't sufficient to confirm that the pregnancy is intrauterine because a hemorrhagic corpus luteum can sometimes be mistaken for a gestational sac. And it's crucial to um, remember about confirming this because we need to exclude an ectopic pregnancy. So then other investigations that need to be arranged are serum HCG. So we would advise a baseline level less than 72 hours prior to, take, prior to starting the termination medication. We would do STI screening um, in pretty much anybody because it's helpful um, in preventing or in reducing the risk of uh, infection following the termination. And just keeping in mind about um, syphilis and HIV testing, which are both um, things that are recommended in New South Wales currently. Haemoglobin, so the actual recommendation is to do this if the person is at risk of anemia, but I would generally consider that any menstruating woman is probably at risk of of anemia. And then consider the blood group and antibodies if there's a possibility of a surgical termination. And just to note that anti-D is no longer required for medical abortion um, since there's been no requirement for that since May of 2021. Contraindications to the medical termination of pregnancy. So in Australia, if people are greater than 63 days gestation, and then they're not eligible for a medical termination, um, as, certainly not as an outpatient uh, or in your clinics. Uh, a suspected or confirmed ectopic pregnancy, also contraindications. Oral corticosteroid use, so for example, in severe asthma or adrenal insufficiency. Um, and just as a note there, in people who have Oh, actually, I've got more coming up about that in a sec. Bleeding disorders or anticoagulants and allergy to the medications that are used, mifepristone and mesoprostol, current pelvic infection and IUD in situ. So if it can be removed, then they, then they can um, have a medical termination following on from that. If it can't be removed, then they're not suitable for medical termination. Lack of access to an emergency care, severe anemia. So we would have quite a caution with someone with a haemoglobin of less than 100 and we would try and look at organising perhaps an iron infusion prior to the termination, and anyone with porphyria. And precautions, um, so with the asthma, um, you need to ensure that they've got an action plan in place, and sometimes they might need to increase their inhaled corticosteroids for a few days after the abortion because of the good anti-glucocorticoid effects of the mifepristone. If people have asthma that's difficult to control, then I would suggest seeking specialist input before prescribing those medications. Diabetes for people who have poor control, um, uh, just because of the nausea and vomiting that, um, that might occur. And epilepsy or seizures, so these are not brought on by the medications that are used, but can sometimes be brought on by pain or vomiting. A history of ischemic heart disease or severe liver, kidney or respiratory disease. And I mean, I guess luckily the majority of our patients tend to be in the younger age brackets that have less of those um, precautions or contraindications. Okay. So moving on now to the medications that we use for abortion. So mifepristone and mesoprostol are the medications that are licensed for use in Australia for medical abortion. And they come in a composite pack that's called MS2-STEP. The regime of mifepristone followed 36 to 48 hours later by mesoprostol has been shown to be highly effective and safe for early medical abortion. And it's recommended by 
and RANSCOG as the method of choice for medical abortion for people up to nine weeks gestation. There are other methods that have been used in the past. So step one is the mifepristone. It's a synthetic steroid. It's a competitive progesterone receptor antagonist that blocks the effects of progesterone and destabilizes the pregnancy. It sensitizes the myometrium to prostaglandins that induce uterine contractions. And it is metabolized in the liver. And so it may have interactions with liver inducing or liver enzyme inhibiting medications, but interaction studies haven't really been done. It is important to note as well that mifepristone is unlisted in terms of pregnancy safety. So once it's taken, we strongly recommend that the process is completed with the step two, as there is a potential for fetal harm following step one um, if the abortion is not completed. Mesoprostol is a synthetic prostaglandin E1 analog. It induces contractions in the smooth muscle of the myometrium and stimulates the cervix to soften leading to the evacuation of the uterine contents. And that pretreatment with mifepristone has been shown to increase the uterine contractility in response to the mesoprostol. It's also considered teratogenic as it's been associated with fetal limb abnormalities. No significant drug interactions have been reported. So just walking through the provision of the medical termination, we usually gain uh, signed informed consent. We discuss the medications and the procedure for the abortion, and we make a written plan for the timing of the medications of step one and step two. We plan for the expected bleeding, pain and nausea. Um, and we routinely use some ibuprofen, panadine, fort and ondansetron prior to taking the step two. It, we provide the Health Direct support phone number and just, which is at that 24 hour phone line that you're probably familiar with. And we discuss with the client when to escalate their care needs. So when to call Health Direct and when to attend the emergency department if required as well. And we give written post-procedure instructions, including um, that there's to be nothing in the vagina for seven days after the, after the termination. We provide a streamlined authority prescription for MS2 step, discuss ongoing contraception needs, and then make a plan for follow-up. Step one, the mifepristone, is just that one tablet taken with a glass of water at the arranged time. And generally nothing happens after taking the step two, uh, sorry, after taking the step one. Up to 5% of people might have some bleeding after taking the step one, but unless they, it's really a lot of bleeding such that they've had to go to the emergency department or to EPAS or something and they've been advised that they've had a complete um, miscarriage or abortion, then we would always advise that they continue on and take the step two to make sure that the process is complete and to minimise the risks of retained products of conception. Step two is taken 36 to 48 hours later um, with the analgesia and antiemetic given 30 minutes prior. The step two is four tablets and they're tucked into the cheek pouches, two on each side of the lower jaw. And they're left for 30 minutes to absorb. So they absorb better that way and are more effective. They're left, uh, and if there's any bits left after 30 minutes, um, they can be just swallowed down with a glass of water. Following taking step two, we expect that bleeding and cramping will begin. The onset can range from 30 minutes to 24 hours after taking the medication, but it usually commences within the first four hours and commonly within the first hour. The cramping often starts first and it's usually more severe than normal period pain. Bleeding is usually much heavier than a normal period and the bleeding and cramping should ease once the products of conception have passed. So people will often note that there's a, some sort of sac or something that's passed. They, they know when that's happened generally. And pain should largely resolve by 24 hours after the medication is taken. Other symptoms can, that can occur include nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and fever or chills. And these symptoms should last less than 24 hours. And at any stage of fever over 38 and a half should alert the client to seek a medical review. 
Complications include a continuing a pregnancy, which affects around 0.8% of people. Um, and this should be considered if there's ongoing pregnancy symptoms or if the expected bleeding doesn't occur. And this may be managed by repeating the MS2 step if the timing is suitable. Um, so as in if it's less than 63 days gestation still, or by a surgical termination um, to complete the termination. A repeat um, serum beta-HCG for a new baseline um, might be required and ultrasound should be considered if there's uncertainty regarding the success of the, of the med medical termination, for example, with that lighter than expected bleeding. If there's no bleeding at all, an ultrasound's not required if, you're, if you think that you need to repeat um, the medications. Excessive bleeding can occur in some people and in 0.13% may require a blood transfusion. And that's why we need people to be within that two hours of an emergency department following on from taking the step two. Upper genital tract infection can affect about 0.1% of people. Um, and again, important to get that treated as soon as possible uh, if people have signs of infection. And, and again, why we check for STIs beforehand, because often it will be caused from an untreated STI uh, that wasn't diagnosed before the termination. Retained products of conception um, affect about three to 5% of people and can sometimes be um, managed expectantly or with a repeat dose of mesoprostol. Um, and about three to five, sorry, three to five percent require surgical intervention for their retained products. And here's a bit more about retained products of conception because it does tend to be one of the uh, more commonly seen complications. Um, so it usually presents with persistent bleeding that's heavier than a usual period. Bleeding may have continued since they took the mesoprostol, that's step two, or it may have initially settled and then really returned. It's important to check hemodynamic stability um, and check that they've had that serum HCG drop of greater than 80% at day seven. Check the full blood count because of that bleeding that they've been having and consider an ultrasound. Um, just um, be cautious if it's less than three weeks following the medical termination because we can have false positives. And just also remember to ask the, for the measurements of any um, retained products of conception because that can be helpful in deciding on management. So retained products that's less than four centimetres can often be managed expectantly or with additional doses of mesoprostol depending on the clinical picture. And retained products greater than four centimetres will often, or that have been persistent or haven't responded to other management will often require um, surgical management. Our um, follow-up here includes a phone call at day three or four after the mifepristone, just to check that things have proceeded as we expected. We get everyone to do a blood test on day seven to check that that serum HCG has dropped by greater than 80% from the baseline, suggesting that the pregnancy has ended. And we then have an, app an appointment at two to three weeks to confirm that the abortion was successful, to check for resolution of bleeding and other symptoms, to provide ongoing contraception and a wellbeing check. Contraception after abortion, it's really important to discuss and offer this, of course, to reduce the risk of repeated unintended pregnancy. But it's also to remember, it's also important to remember to respect client choice. So just because someone has had an abortion um, doesn't mean that we need to push um, our contraception onto them any more than we would anybody else. Our, our job is really just to offer all the options that are available to them. Following a medical abortion, all contraceptive options other than the IUD can be started at the time of the abortion and if they're commenced within day one to five will be immediately effective. Um, a surgical abortion, so again, all contraceptive op options can be started immediately. But as I think I mentioned before, the LARCs, our implants and IUDs, can often be inserted at the time of the procedure. So that can be a really time efficient way of doing that if women are interested in an IUD particularly can often just get popped in at the same time. 
saving any additional visits. The Implanon can be inserted any time after medical abortion and the progesterone contraceptives theoretically compete with mifepristone but there's limited evidence that it affects the efficacy of the medical termination and it's important just to think about you know whether it's better to do it at the time of the provision so that you know that you've got your contraception on board whether there's going to be difficulties for that client to follow up and do that later on um, the combined oral contraceptive pill can be started on the day after the mifepristone, the step one is taken. Again, with the depot, there's a theoretical concern that it might affect the, the efficacy of the termination if given at the same time as the mifepristone. But again, particularly if there's issues with access, uh, it can certainly be given on the same day. And the vaginal ring can be inserted once heavy bleeding has eased. Copper or progesterone releasing IUDs can be inserted once the products of conception have passed. In practice, this will often occur at the follow-up appointment at two to three weeks once the abortion success is confirmed. So it's ideal if, the, if an IUD assessment can be done at the time of the medical termination workup visit so that that can be planned as part of the follow-up as well. All right. Phoebe, were there any questions um, for the moment or shall I go on to the case studies? Uh, you can go on to the case studies if you like. I think I've answered, there are a few little questions along the way, but I've answered them as we went along. So. Okay, good, great. So first up, we've got Diane, who's 41. Um, she has two children. She's got 10 and 12 year old daughters. She's separated from their dad and she has a casual partner and they had unprotected sex. And her last menstrual period was six weeks ago. She is shocked to discover that she's pregnant. She didn't think that at this age she could still conceive and she certainly does not wish to continue the pregnancy. Um, So we're going to arrange, well, we arrange some we arrange some investigations for Diane. Her ultrasound shows a yolk sac, there's no heartbeat, and on measurements they've estimated the gestation to be five plus three. She has a full blood count and her hemoglobin is 120. Her serum HCG is 20,000, and her STI screen is negative for chlamydia and gonorrhea and HIV added the HIV and syphilis onto her bloods and that was also negative. Uh, and just something to think about that if she, um, so Diane in this case study is designed to be a very healthy woman with normal menstrual periods that are not heavy, but if someone was to have heavy periods or a heavy history of heavy menstrual bleeding, uh, it can be important to add a ferritin on at the time of doing those initial blood tests as well. So you have a long discussion, oh, let me just, sure if I can, can I go back? Okay, so some things to think about in here. What if there, so in this instance, we've got a yolk sac that we've seen on her ultrasound, but what if there was no yolk sac and she had a pregnancy of unknown location? So in that instance, we would need to give her advice about considering an ectopic pregnancy and about following up um, with an ultrasound and when to attend emergency if she has increased symptoms. <coughs> so following your discussion, she decides that she would like to go ahead with a medical termination. She has a close friend who'll stay with her following step two. And she decides to take the step one on Wednesday evening at eight o'clock and then she's planning to do the step two on Friday morning at nine o'clock after the girls go to school. Um, of course, taking that on down to Tron, some Panadine for it and ibuprofen just prior to that. And this is often, you know, um, people will have different ideas about when the best time for them to take the step two is. And that's something that I usually discuss with patients as well. Um, so people with families, um, may sometimes choose, if they don't have daycare or school, they may sometimes choose to take the step two in the evening after the kids have gone to bed. 
And there can be a challenge with this if they do, then do need to go to the emergency or something like that. Um, but this is a good option for Diane because the girls are at school and hopefully the worst of things will be over um, by the time they're coming home. And, you know, hopefully they can go to a friend's house or something like that if, if they, um, as if Diane's still in the midst of things by the time the girls are coming home. So Diane, as planned, takes her two step at 9 a.m. and then around 11, she starts to have some cramping and bleeding, which becomes very heavy about half an hour later. And she passes some large clots and something that seemed like a sack around midday. She vomits once during this process and by one o'clock the bleeding is just like a heavy period and she's still got cramps but they're not as bad as they were around that 11 30 12 o'clock time. The nausea has passed and by three o'clock her bleeding has lessened and she's now changing a pad every two or three hours and still a little bit of cramping remains but she's taken another dose of ibuprofen and managing okay. So at her three-day phone follow-up, she's still got light bleeding, but otherwise she's feeling pretty fine and things went as she expected they were going to. She's very compliant and does her blood test on day seven, which shows a drop of 95% compared to the baseline measurement. So just confirming that that um, has gone as expected. Uh, and that the pregnancy has ended. She has her three week follow up appointment and her, she still is, has a very little bit of bleeding going on. Um, and she has an IUD inserted at her follow up appointment. So that's what it looks like when things all go very smoothly. And um, that's essentially an example of when things go completely according to plan, and sometimes they do. Um, the next case is Ella, who is 15. Her period is late and she has a positive urine pregnancy test. She has a boyfriend, but it's not a long-term relationship. She's in year 10 at school and she lives with her parents, but she really doesn't want to tell them about the pregnancy. And she's come in with her 16-year-old friend as her, as her support person. So, I think you can see that there's going to be a lot of things to discuss um, in these consultations and it might take se several consultations to really complete the assessment. She's going to need a HEADS assessment, okay. we're going to need to assess gillet competency, can she consent to the procedure, we'll need to be looking at um, the age of consent to sexual intercourse and considering the age of her partner. Um, you know, whether that's someone who's within a similar age to her or someone who's not within a similar age to her and it might be something that needs to be reported. Um, she's going to need a support person who is going to need to be an adult um, in an ideal world. So we need to um, investigate those options with her as well. Ideally, in this situation, it would be great to have um, a team to support you with social workers and um, doctors and nurses all involved um, and someone like this if you feel that it's outside of your scope of practice perfectly reasonable to try and um, refer them across to family planning or an experienced um, provider of abortion services as well. Um, Phoebe, I realise as well that originally when I wrote these, it was for uh, a presentation that involved a group chat. And so I'm just wondering. <laughs> it's funny, you can't talk, have anyone talk to you. <laughs> I know, like 90, 90 people might be too many to just pop in with questions, but any <laughs> any questions or comments or uh, We did have one question come through there just about confirming into uterine pregnancy on ultrasound, um, which I've replied to, but yes, um, you only need a yolk sac uh, to confirm that it's intrauterine and exclude an ectopic. Um, I mean, potentially there is always the possibility of a heterotopic pregnancy, but it's one in 10,000 or something. So um, yeah. we can be confident that we've got an intrauterine pregnancy um, with just a yolk sac. 
Um, so we can actually confirm that quite early on. Most good sonographers can do that at sort of, what would you say, five and five, five and Something, three even. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess just another point with that is that um, the PBS requirements for the use of the MS2 step is an intrauterine pregnancy. It doesn't specify a viable intrauterine pregnancy. Um, if anyone was going to be concerned about that. So we don't need to prove that the pregnancy is viable before providing a termination. And we just need to prove that it's intrauterine. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I mean, I do occasionally have a patient who would like to know um, and will ask for a repeat ultrasound to confirm viability or yeah. um, a heart rate, a heartbeat beforehand um, so they know what they're doing. But um, I have to say that's probably the minority. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks, Vivi. And these are very, very complex, these ones, aren't they? Yeah, they are. And it's, <laughs> you know, I think if you if you have this patient show up in your standard general practice, you might feel quite tired after about five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> but do, you know, just, you know, refer on to us, get advice, um, or yeah and and hopefully um phoebe you might have some more tips later about specific referral pathways as well or um erica as well so pathways for referral um so this is not for referral for the abortion in itself um but for help with the process so emergency departments obviously for heavy bleeding or significant pain particularly in the context of a pregnancy of unknown location there are early pregnancy assessment services at many major hospitals and they can assist with the surgical management of retained products as well. And they'll see women for bleeding in pregnancy um, as well. The timing of, of where they're at in the pregnancy and where they're at in the day may determine whether they attend emergency or EPAS. Um, Pathways for assistance with access to abortion are variable between different hospitals in different regions and are undergoing ongoing development. So it's something that we're um, involved in advocating for as well. Uh, and there are slow improvements in the way that this is being managed through our public systems as well. Um, that's really the end of my presentation and I'm just going to put in a little plug for OSCAPS. So OSCAPS is an NH and MRC funded community of practice. Um, so, and this is a little bit of a spiel about it, but essentially what it does is it connects people who are involved in abortion and in long, long acting contraception primarily. And there are GPs, nurses, pharmacists um, involved in this. And people, and there are there are experts in these areas who um, will regularly contribute or answer questions. So if you've got a particular question about a medical abortion patient that you have, you can actually write something directly into the chat and someone will respond to you, usually within a few hours. Uh, it's actually, having, having only relatively recently joined myself, I've been quite surprised at how useful it was. Um, and yet yeah, lots of um, directions to useful resources as well. So this is just some topic examples. But yeah, it's certainly something that I would encourage you to join up to if this is your area. And that's a scanny code, but I'm not sure if you can realistically use that through here. But if you just search it up, it'll come up with how to join. Okay, so if you've got any questions, you can fire away or Phoebe is going to join now with some um, more case studies. Yeah, awesome. Um, there was one question that just came through then, um, the age of, I assume we're talking about the 16 year old um, client, the age of her regular male partner would be important to know about her safety um, and the nature of the relationship. Absolutely, um, I have that same thought when I was reading that slide. Um, that's really important to know um, whether there are any um, reporting requirements um, that you would need to do child protection wise 
Um, all right, I'll just show my screen, sorry. So I just had a couple of other cases um, to run through that are cases that I've seen in the last um, 12 months, um, providing MTOP services in my private practice. Um, and just to give you an idea about uh, the sort of things that come up. Um, so, so this was a 29-year-old um, woman who was G5, P3, and had previously had a surgical termination um, five years earlier. She uh, was fairly well, but did have some major, major orth orthopaedic surgery planned um, in the next month. She and her partner had been using withdrawal, um, surprisingly common. Um, the partner was aware of the pregnancy and supportive of her decision, um, and she was keen for a medical termination. We took the opportunity to organise a self-collected CST, uh, and she presented to us having had ultrasound and bloods done already. Um, so she was eight weeks and five days when we saw her at the term, time of her first appointment. So we were able to provide um, a same day medical termination for her uh, and we set that up in our, um, in our practice so that we have a certain number of appointments set aside to be able to do kind of assessment and provision appointments together, um, so many of those per week, uh, and we leave them as kind of on the day uh, appointment time so that we can use them at short notice. Um, obviously not everyone's going to be able to do that, but um, we found that that's really helpful if this is something that you want to be able to provide um, sort of with little notice. So we, uh, there, I mean, there are different ways that you can organise follow-up for these patients um, and um, family planning certainly have a great system and with lots of nurses and backup um, to be able to be doing these phone calls. Um, I don't think necessarily everyone provides the same sort of follow-up that family planning do. They're quite conservative. Um, we would generally give a phone call uh, after the day seven blood, so when we've got the result, um, and then we can let them know what the result was and check in um, on the proviso, of course, that we've done all that um, safety netting at that provision appointment. So this particular case, we gave her a phone call on day nine. She described really appropriate bleeding after step two. So she'd had moderate to large clots and now the bleeding had eased off. And her baseline beta HCG, you can see there, but her day eight beta HCG had actually risen. And so obviously um, something's not right. Um, we haven't got that 80% or more drop. So we were able to organise an ultrasound on the same day uh, and it's really helpful to have some good connections with local imaging providers so that you can try and access ultrasounds quickly if you need them, um, particularly for, for dating afterwards but also for complications. Um, and this actually showed an ongoing pregnancy um, and, a, and a viable pregnancy. So interestingly, this lady had uh, actually early on not made a decision about whether she was going to go medical or surgical and had already made an appointment with GCA, which is Gynecology Centre of Australia, um, in Broadmeadow, and she'd uh, not happened to cancel that appointment. So uh, she still had an appointment available uh, for a surgical termination, which is what she needed to complete this process for her. So obviously, as we know, this is... Um, fairly rare, uh, less than 1% usually, but um, that was my one case for the 12 months, <laughs> I hope. So my second case was uh, a 25 year old uh, primate who was eight plus five, uh, again on ultrasound organized by another GP. She'd been on Zoli for a month, she tells me, but um, she hadn't actually done a pregnancy test before she started it um, or a quick start pregnancy test after she started it. So she didn't realise that she was already pregnant prior to starting. Her um, casual partner was not aware of the pregnancy. She did have a history of iron deficiency, but her haemoglobin was good at 124. And again, we were able to provide a same day medical termination, um, given that we had all the results that we needed. So as is not uncommon, she didn't attend her baseline uh, or day seven bloods. We did have a beta HCG that was done by her previous GP uh, 
seven days prior to step one. Um, we uh, called her for her day 10 follow-up. She'd had some bleeding lighter than what's expected after step two, and it is important to get a fairly good history about what sort of bleeding they were talking about after step two. Um, but then on day eight and nine had had slightly heavier bleeding, changing pads every few hours. So we asked her to urgently um, have her bloods done and uh, to give us some idea about where we were up to. Um, and again, had a, a detailed conversation about what to do if the bleeding or if bleeding was escalating or if she started to get pain or other symptoms. She finally got around to having that, those bloods done on day 15. She still had a beta HCG of 509. Hard to interpret um, because we didn't get a baseline. Um, we go for a phone call when we got those results and she had ongoing moderate bleeding with clots up to 50 cent size and now some mild pelvic pain, but no fever. We started some augment in duo four and requested an ultrasound at that stage. Before she actually managed to get that ultrasound done, she did actually present to John Hunter um, to the emergency department on day 21 um, because the bleeding had become heavier and she had an ultrasound uh, that was organised um, as an outpatient the next day that showed retained products. She was referred directly from emergency to EPAS, so didn't have to see us again, referred to EPAS on day 24 and they performed um, a DNC on day 27. So um, I think it's important to know that uh, the process for dealing with complications is fairly streamlined, at least in Hunter New England, um, that as John Hunter provides their own termination service um, for, you know, with under limited criteria, um, they're used to dealing with uh, complications um, and the the follow-up process is really streamlined. So um, I think it's important to feel supported um, and not be particularly worried um, about having to deal with complications as a GP in the community. Um, I've just seen a little question come through here. Let me see. What percentage of medical termination ends up requiring stop? Um, I don't know if I can give it actual number so the the chances of needing um the chance of having retained products is probably about three to four percent after medical termination um, but not all of those will then need a surgical procedure so um some will be able to be managed expectantly um, and watching and waiting and often with the next period they'll pass um, any remaining tissue uh, some will be able to have a repeat dose of misoprostol and that will sort things out for them. Um, and then some will need a surgical procedure and that's going to depend a little bit on um, how heavy their bleeding is, what the clinical picture is. And this leads on very well to Erica's talk, but um, if you have a look at health pathways for Central Coast and for Hunter New England, it's really clear um, how to manage these complications. We're really lucky to have a really good um, health pathway set out, lots of detail. Um, I just, you can't go wrong. I think it's um, it's really helpful to have that. So just go and check if you're not sure what you're up to. The other good um, resource is ETG. So ETG have a really good um, medical abortion section as well. All right, I'm gonna hand over to Erica. Thanks, Phoebe. I'll just share my slides. Are those uh, slides showing okay there, Jenny? No, not yet. Okay. You might have to select a different screen. I'm just going to um, do this. This might work. Great. Thank you. Yes, we can see them now. Excellent. Thank you very much. Just pop into presenter mode. Okay, That's here it. we go. So, 
Um, I'm presenting on behalf of both uh, Hunter New England and Central Coast uh, Health Pathways teams tonight. So um, this is our login details. So on the left, you've got the Hunter New England Health Pathways login details and also our companion site, uh, Hunter New England Patient Info. And on the right hand side, the Central Coast Health Pathways and Patient Info sites. So obviously Health Pathways is designed for clinicians and password protected um, and then Patient Info is for general community and it's open access. Anyone can find that online. All right, so in terms of the updates, so both uh, Health Pathways teams have recently updated the termination of pregnancy pathways in light of the change regarding MS2 step. So uh, the Hunter New England team wanted me to let you know uh, that we'd, we'd like to acknowledge Tanya Day, Angela Dunford, Phoebe, who's presented just before me, and Kate Hagger, who've all contributed to their recent update to their termination pathway. And on the Central Coast uh, perspective, Dr Jill Sass is one of our GP clinical editors in our team, and uh, Dr Ebony Tosh and Dr Christina Love contributed to the Central Coast update as well. So I'd just like to acknowledge um, the collaborative work of all of those uh, subject matter experts who contributed to these updates. Uh, so here on the slides, uh, the Hunter New England pathways that are relevant to this topic. Obviously, there's the specific termination of pregnancy pathway and then the subpage specifically about prescribing MS2 step. And then there's also the contraception pathways. So there's uh, quite a number of contraceptive pathways that are really detailed. Um, and then the long-term contraception referrals page as well. And just a reminder that on each Health Pathways website is the daily updates page as well. So uh, that summarises all of the recent changes that have been made on all pathways. And that's really good for you to look at quickly to find out what the most recent changes have been. All right, and then in terms of the Central Coast website, um, they're slightly different between the two regions. So Central Coast, we have the termination of pregnancy and then the two subpages, a medical termination and the follow-up for termination of pregnancy pages. Um, on the Central Coast, we've also got the pregnancy options counselling. So that's um, a list of accredited providers who can provide that counselling for women who are considering their options. We've also got the referral page specifically for if uh, a doctor wants to refer on to a specialised termination provider, including those who provide medical and surgical. So that, that's uh, there if, if you're still um, referring on or have a complicated case that you're uh, wanting to refer. Again, all of the contraception uh, pathways and the daily updates for the recent changes. Okay, so now I'll switch over and we'll just do a live demo um, of the sites so we can visually show you. Okay, so um, on the Central Coast website, if you just use the search bar termination and then uh, you'll find that uh, several options pop up of the most um, pages where termination is mentioned most. Uh, so we've got the page here with the two sub pages. And then if you're looking for some of the referral links as well, so um, options for if women are seeking uh, the pregnancy counselling, there's a drop down here in assessment six. Also, there's the referral page a little bit further down regarding counselling. So that links through to that page that I was referring to earlier. Um, so we've got psychologists listed, social workers, mental health nurses who are accredited, and then public options as well. So there's local options, um, out of area options, and New South Wales wide, for example, and Australia wide services. Um, also, I'll just show you the referral page for referral for termination of pregnancy. So there's quite detailed information on these options as well. So in our drop downs here, um, 
the information goes into what options there are for the woman and uh, at what weeks can be provided and the locations. So um, there's out of area options as well, given the, the limited um, options that there are in terms of referring on. All right, uh, and then the follow up page. So just in terms of uh, what a GP may need to attend to in terms of following the woman up and then a page specifically about the medical termination. So those are the Central Coast pages and then I'll just flip over to Hunter New England. So this is the Hunter New England website. We've got the termination of pregnancy page here. Uh, the team wanted to um, just flag that they've just updated yesterday. Um, a new uh, guideline has been released by RANSCOG uh, and so you can find that in right down the end here in Four Health Professionals, the RANSCOG Clinical Guideline for Abortion Care and incorporated in that is also a decision aid. So I'll just pop back and show you in assessment three, patient decision aid drop down. So this here links straight to that as well. So that's just been incorporated uh, in Hunter New England yesterday and the Central Coast team will be uh, doing another update to incorporate that as well. Uh, and then in terms of management, in management four, this links directly to the sub page and you can also find it over here on the left in the table of contents, specifically regarding the steps for prescribing MS2 step. And then um, information back on the top level page as well regarding surgical and how that can be arranged. Just scroll down to referral and in the referral section, there's the options there if you need to refer on for surgical termination. Okay, I think that's all that I wanted to share with you regarding Health Pathways. So I'll stop sharing my screen and we might pop back and just see if there's any other questions. Thanks so much, um, everybody. Um, we might just try something, uh, we've got 26 people online tonight. So I'm going to um, unmute everybody. And if you would like to ask a question instead of typing one in, um, please uh, raise your hand. You'll see that there's a little hand icon and I will say your name and you can ask a question. You may have all been um, too good at covering your topic tonight, I think. <laughs> well, everyone's already asked their questions. I was going to say, say um, that, oh, sorry. sorry. That Health Pathways is amazing. Uh, it's a, that's such a great resource to have. And not every um, uh, health district has such a good one. And I think the other thing that's um, I think that Phoebe mentioned is on there is links to, or that maybe you mentioned is on, is links to um, consent forms and that sort of thing that you can use to help through the process as well. And having those forms pre-made is very helpful, uh, as is making up autofills for your own consultations um, for the medical termination as well. That's we all. do have a hand up, which is from Kim Collins. Kim, would you like to ask your question? I was just going to ask about anti-D for women who are RH negative. I'm assuming you don't need to use that for MTOPS. And are they still using it for STOP, for STOPS, sorry? Yeah. So definitely no requirement to use anti-D for MTOPS. Um, they are still, well, I think it, the new RANSCOG guideline, I think, no, maybe it's still so in the UK. I think that there is that they're not necessarily using NTD for surgical terminations as well. Um, 
I have a feeling that the new guideline may have something in it about that, um, but I just can't now remember what I read the other day. But Thanks. I think it will be in process. Thank you. Um, if I could just um, reiterate, whilst there's no requirement to do the MS two-step uh, training in order to be a, an MTOP prescriber. Um, if you partner with us at Search, um, you have access to a four-hour self-paced um, uh, recorded seminar, which really goes into all of what Sarah and Phoebe have talked about in much greater detail. So it also gives you um, more confidence, I guess, more information, as well as access to all the assessment forms and um, patient information, etc., that you can add with your own practice information. So if you're interested in becoming an MTOP prescriber, then um, please reach out and um, I'll have a chat and uh, support you as much as I can. Thanks so much, Susie. Um, and if anyone needs um, Susie's contact details, please just flick me an email because I know you all have it because I send you out hundreds of emails and I can send you her contact details. And um, don't forget that we will have the recording in the library along with the PDF copy of the presentations. Well, I think that might be it. Uh, I was just going to say as well, I'm happy to be contacted as well for the local people for Hunting England um, and Central Coast. Um, if people want my contact details, just reach out to the PHN as well. Fantastic. All right. Well, thank you very much, um, everyone, for coming. And thank you so much for the presenters tonight for giving up your time. Um, and um, we'll see you all again soon. Good night.